thank you, Jackson Lab, for having me um, come and talk today. This is a really exciting opportunity. So um, just as I realize, not Everyone in this audience will have been working with CAR T cells as long as I have. I just wanted to give a brief overview as to how CAR T cell therapy is currently working with um, the approved products. So currently every FDA approved CAR T cell product in the United States um, is what we consider an autologous product, which means that it is personal because it comes from the T cells of the individual cancer patient. So essentially what happens um, to begin with, a cancer patient is put on an apheresis machine, which looks much like a kidney dialysis machine. The T cells are removed from the blood and then they're shipped off to a manufacturing facility. Um, and this is one of the big holdups in the field because the manufacturing is actually very expensive and very complicated to get everyone's exact cells back to them. So in this manufacturing facility, um, some kind of vector is used to insert the gene for the CAR or chimeric antigen receptor into the T cell. Um, it's either retro or lentivirus at this point for all of the approved products. Um, and then that T cell is also given stimulation. So it begins to grow and expand as it begins to express the cars. And then this production time frame lasts anywhere from three to seven days, typically. Um, it goes through a series of QC. And then it's shipped back to the hospitals where the patients just before receiving their cars receive lymphodepleting chemotherapy so that there's enough room for the CAR T cells to engraft. And then the T cells are infused back into the patients. And if all goes well, the T cells expressing the CAR recognize the, the cancer cells via the antigen, and then those cancer cells are killed. So if we look a little closer as to what this CAR actually is, I like to call it a Franken molecule because we've stolen a lot of the pieces from various molecules um, in the immunology field. So the part that recognizes tumor antigen, which happens directly, there's no um, need for presentation on MHC, this part of the, the CAR molecule is derived from an antibody sequence. And so we just take the top single chain variable fragment and we link them together. And there can always be multiple orientations of this with a, a heavy light or a light heavy. Um, there is one FDA approved product that's actually based on a camelid antibody and it has two of um, the camelid antibodies. So they're two VHHs, but everything else looks like this. Um, then there's some kind of hinge or spacer domain often derived from the same molecule as the transmembrane domain. So this is frequently CD8 or CD28. And then what makes this a second generation car and the FDA approved cars are all this as well is by having one co-stimulatory domain. So initially this domain did not exist in the cars. There was just the CD3 zeta signaling and the cars didn't do anything clinically and everyone thought the field was dead. Then we had some immunologists get involved understanding that T cells needed signal one and signal two, um, added in the co-stim, and now we have some really amazing responses in patients. So we get signaling from both this co-stim domain, which is frequently CD28 or 41BB, but also in trial, just not FDA approved, is OX40 and ICOS ligand. And then we have the CD3 zeta signaling as well, which has a signaling cascade similar to what we would um, see with a typical uh, T cell receptor signaling. Um, and so we don't know exactly how CAR T cells kill. We do know that many of the elements for normal conventional T cell killing are involved, such as perforin and granzyme, but this is actually a, a field of exploration and something that we'll talk about a little bit today. We do know that perforin is required, and so we perforate the, the holes of the tumor cell membrane. Um, to, to then enact death of the tumor cell. So this is a list of the current six FDA approved products. Um, what you can see predominantly here is that these are all targeting what we refer to as liquid tumors. So this is lymphoma, leukemia, and then multiple myeloma is the most recent approvals with BCMA. So C19 and BCMA are the two antigens that have been FDA approved at this time, all targeting various stages of the B cell lineage. And I say this has all occurred in liquid tumor, and it's not for lack of trying in the solid tumor front, but solid tumors present an additional series of problems that have become difficult for the field to overcome. Um, so here's an example, though, that we do think that there's room to grow in this field, and we think that 
there will be a day where we see CAR T cells getting approved in solid tumors. And so this is an example of a patient who had glioblastoma, which is an overall very devastating disease with a 15-month median survival. And so this patient received what's called an IL-13 receptor alpha-2 CAR, and they happen to have an intraventricular vent at the time um, right into their brain. And so the CARs were actually infused directly into the brain. And what we can see here in this yellow circle is that there was regression of tumor over time. Um, due to infusion of the car. And so this is very exciting for the field. Eventually the patient, however, did relapse with antigen negative disease. Um, so there's a variety of reasons why cars are not finding great success in solid tumors. And that's one of them, antigen loss, which we also do see in the liquid tumor field. But then there are additional added um, complications of the tumor microenvironment where you can have a very suppressive um, milieu of other cells and cytokines and extracellular matrix. And then something that's been less studied is the intrinsic tumor resistance. And this is something that our lab hypothesized that maybe just tumor cells themselves taken in to even taken out of the tumor microenvironment, maybe there's a difference in how solid and liquid tumor cells are responding to CAR T cells. Um, and so this kind of led us to our initial hypothesis that there were particular pathways being utilized by CAR T cells in order to kill, and maybe it was easier for a solid tumor cell to lose just a single gene and overcome this killing than maybe a liquid tumor cell. So we conducted a whole genome-wide CRISPR screen in glioblastoma, and I'll say now everything that I'm showing you today is a human cell, whether it be tumor or T cell, and then the mice experiments that I show are all in a, a, an NSG mouse that have a um, very lacking innate, uh, innate immune system and do not have an adaptive immune system. So this is a glioblastoma cell line that we utilize for the screen called UED7, um, again, human. And so we transduced this to constitutively express Cas9 and then introduced a, a lentiviral sgRNA library called Brunello, which you can receive from the Broad um, in Cambridge, Mass. And so this library has over 70,000 guides. And so it targets the entire genome with representation of four guides per gene. And so we transduce it a very low MOI so that each cell mathematically was only receiving one gene knockout. And then these were all on a pyromyosin um, backbone, resistant backbone, so we could select so that all of the cells going into the screen presumably had some kind of knockout. Then we had a variety of controls. So the first arm of the screen was just to represent how many of these guides actually went into the screen. Next, we had a proliferation control in case any of the guides conferred a proliferative advantage. And so this went throughout the duration of the screen. And then finally, we had our sample arms where we were actually testing what the pressure of CAR T cells was doing on these cells. So we um, conducted the screen at an IC50, where we had about one CAR T cell to 10 tumor cells, and we used EGFR CARs. Um, and the reason why we did this is that EGFR is very highly and endogenously expressed on U87 cells, as well as a variety of glioblastoma and other solid tumor cells. So it's a very useful tool in the lab. However, it's not something that would be used clinically due to toxicities. Um, and we ran this for an overnight co-culture and then rinsed off the T cells, moved the tumor cells, and then allowed them to recover for uh, two days. And then we sequenced every cell that was remaining to see what guides were um, able to resist the CAR T cell killing. So by far the highest hit out of this screen was EGFR, which again, this is something that we know about the field because if you lose the antigen, the T cell no longer can recognize the tumor and it no longer exerts that killing function. However, what was surprising to us is the, the pathway that came out just below EGFR and, and the strongest pathway by far in this screen was interfering gamma receptor signaling. And so we see both components of the receptor, receptor one and receptor two, JAK2, JAK1 was also on this list as well as STAT1 up here. So um, this 
if you come from the T-cell field, may not initially sound exciting, but I'm going to try to convince you why it's exciting in the context of CAR T-cells. So if we look at the canonical view of what interferon gamma is doing in the tumor microenvironment and why we wanted it there when we're treating cancer is because we wanted to upregulate MHC1 and MHC2 on antigen presenting cells so that T cells can exert their killing function. However, I already showed you earlier that a car circumvents this pathway and recognizes antigen directly. So we no longer need that upregulation of MHC1 and MHC2. In addition, interferon gamma recruits other immune cells into the tumor microenvironment. Um, but this screen that I just showed you was occurring in a dish. All we had was a tumor cell and a T cell, and this was still coming out as um, one of the major hits. And then the other thing that happens with interferon gamma is upregulation of co-stimulation. And CAR is very unique because it already has that co-stim built into the molecule itself. So if we go through, we're recognizing antigen directly. The co-stim is already there, and then we don't need other immune cells in the context of this DISH experiment where we only have two cells, and we know that this hit is important. So we decided to follow up on this in vitro just by generating knockouts of the interferon gamma receptor um, of the same cells just to compare it to wild type to see if there was any resistance in killing as our screen would suggest. So these are the same UED7 glioblastoma cells that um, we used in the screen. And here we have the wild type on the top and the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts on the bottom. And so this is um, an incusite assay where basically we're able to monitor tumor cells over time. But in addition, we're able to monitor CAR T cells. So very small right now in red are little CAR T cells and then the green cells are the tumor. And so if we look at a wild type um, co-culture over time, what we see is that over the course of 72 hours, the CAR T cells not only recognize the tumor cells and kill them, but also expand over time so that the only thing that's left by the end are these red um, CAR T cells. But if we have an interferon gamma receptor 1 knockout, which expresses the same amount of EGFR antigen that the CARs are targeted against, we see that there's a reduction in the CAR T cells' ability to kill these tumor cells. However, we still see expansion of the CAR. And so what we're able to do is quantify the amount of green area in these assays to generate um, cytotoxicity curves. And so we conducted all of our experiments with two gene knockouts um, using different guides uh, for each of our cell lines, just to ensure that this wasn't due to off-target um, effects of the guide. And what we see um, consistently is that while wild type cells are killed over 72 hours, the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts are killed to some degree, but have significant resistance to the CAR T cell's ability to kill. And so we wanted to see if this was intrinsic to just this EGFR U87 co-culture that we were doing or if this applied more broadly. So here what I'm showing is the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 CAR on the same U87 cells. Um, and so this was the CAR that I showed earlier that had had some clinical um, activity. And so what we see here is essentially exactly the same as we saw with the EGFR car, where at the 72-hour time point, we have almost no tumor cells left on the wild type, but with the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts, the CAR T cells are no longer able to kill to the same degree. This was also true beyond glioblastoma. So we tested this in multiple other lines, including pancreatic that I'm showing here. So there, these are two human pancreatic tumor cell lines BXPC3 and ASPC1 targeted with two different CARs, EGFR and mesothelin. Mesothelin is also being tested clinically at this time. And we observed the same, where if you knock out the interferon gamma receptor um, molecule in the tumor cells, the CAR T cells were no longer able to kill. And so we wanted to make sure this wasn't just an in vitro phenomena. So we used our NSG mice and implanted these UED7 cells subcutaneously. And then a week later, treated with half a million EGFR CAR and then monitored by caliper measurements over time to see. And so we had a variety of different um, tumor cells. We had wild type. And this is what the wild type growth curves look like. So this is by no means a curative model. It is very difficult to get cure in these GBM cells. Um, but what we see is that when treated with EGFR CAR compared to untransduced, that's what the UTD stands for here, untransduced T cells from the same donor, we know we are able to 
cause um, slower tumor outgrowth with treatment with the EGFR car. However, if EGFR is knocked out on the tumor cells, we no longer see an advantage of being treated with EGFR car. And then if we test these on the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts, what it appears is that the, the T cells no longer are able to cause that regression of tumor cell growth. And this looks much more similar to the tumor curve when there's no antigen present compared, present compared to wild type tumor. And so we wanted to test this again in a more um, physiologically relevant models. So we used an intracranial injection of a different um, GBM cell line called G251 in these same NSG mice, and then again treated with EGFR car. And the tumor cells here um, are luciferized, so we're able to image over time to see the effects of the the T cells on the tumor growth. So in the wild type environment, here is a, an example of the CAR versus the UTD treated of these animals. You can see the untransduced T cells have no control of tumor growth over time, whereas the, the CAR T cells um, are able to control the tumor. And so we're again able to quantify the flux due to this um, luciferase. And what we see here is that again, the EGFR CAR um, is able to control the tumor growth, whereas the untransduced T cell treated animals have tumor growing out over time. And this also equates to an increase in survival with the, the EGFR car treated animals compared to the untransduced treated. If we look at EGFR knockouts, we see that we lose both the um, advantage of tumor growth and survival due to EGFR car treatment, and the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts look the same, validating what we had seen in vitro and in our subcutaneous model. So next we tested this in a pancreatic system. So we used the ASPC1 cells that I showed earlier in vitro, and this time they were injected intraperitoneally, and we also treated with mesothelin CAR IP as well and imaged over time. So for simplification, I'm just showing the CAR-treated groups here, and what we see is that, again, the wild-type tumor responds to mesocar treatment, whereas the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockout tumors look much more like an antigen knockout tumor. Again, this equates to a difference in survival as well. So we're seeing this phenomena across different antigens, across different tumors in different locations. It seems that the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockout tumors do not respond to CAR T cell killing in the same way. We wanted to con um, confirm that all of this was due to interferon gamma being produced by the CAR T cells themselves. So we have a somewhat complicated, but I'll try to break it down, um, system where we're able to knock out various genes in the cars um, instead of knocking them out in the tumors. And so our control system is shown on the top. And so the track stands for the TCR alpha locus. So essentially, we're able to determine where Cas9 has had activity in these cells by seeing any of the CD3 knockout T cells in this environment um, after being electroporated with Cas9. And so basically anything that's CD3 negative has seen Cas9. And so then we have our test here, which has both the track guides, so it should be CD3 negative, and then also has an interferon gamma guide to knock out interferon gamma on the CAR side instead. So if we stimulate these cells either with um, tumor cells presenting antigen or PMA inomycin, you can see that they no longer are able to produce gamma compared to the track knockout cells. So then we tested these um, against our wild type and interferon gamma receptor one knockout tumor cells. So if we just look at typical EGFR car that's been sorted, we see that we have um, increased killing against wild type compared to the gamma receptor one knockouts. If we lose the TCR, we still retain the, um, the difference in the wild type versus gamma receptor one knockouts. But when there's no gamma on the T cells and there's no gamma receptor on the tumor cells, you no longer see an advantage of wild type killing over the gamma receptor one knockout, showing that this is all very distinct to the gamma being produced by the T cells and acting on the gamma receptor one knockouts on the tumor side. So we wanted to know if this was happening just on the tumor cell side or if the T cells were actually having a deficit in their normal function as a result of the lack of interferon gamma response from the tumor cells. So we looked at proliferation 
um, across interfering gamma receptor one knockouts. And also we validated this against JAK1 and JAK2 knockouts. And we saw that there was no significant difference in CAR T cells of um, proliferation after seeing any of these knockout tumor cells. And this also was true for activation, um, both through CD69 and LFA1, um, as well as degranulation, suggesting that no matter what the tumor cell was expressing, as long as antigen was present, even if there was a lack of expression in the interferon gamma receptor one pathway, the T cells were responding the same. And so we all, we did that in short term, but then we were wondering if maybe perhaps over long term, we would get a more exhausted or a different type of phenotype of the T cells if they were continuously exposed to these um, interferon gamma receptor pathway knockout tumor cells. So we took CAR T cells and then we would stimulate them with either glioblastoma cells of wild type or knockout um, multiple times over the course of a month. And we observed that there was no significant difference in wild type versus gamma receptor one knockout proliferation on the T cell side. Um, there was no significant difference across several different checkpoint molecules like 3, 10, 3, and PD-1, nor was there any difference in phenotype depending on what the CARs had been exposed to, suggesting that the CARs were responding the exact same way no matter what tumor they were seeing. So next, we wanted to know, because this hadn't really been reported before, um, however, most of the fields had always worked in the liquid tumor environment, especially when studying T cars on the basic science side of things. This had always been um, studied in more of the lymphoma or leukemia environment. So next, we wanted to know if this was also true when tested with the CD19 CAR against its typical um, lymphoma and leukemia. So here's these same in vitro cytotoxicity assays I've shown earlier. And this time we're looking at a liquid tumor line. This is a leukemia line called NOM6, again, human, treated with CD19 CAR, a, a vector that looks very similar to what's used clinically. And to our surprise, there was no effect when the gamma receptor was knocked out on the tumor cells. It looked exactly the same as wild type. The T cells couldn't tell the difference and responded the same. This was also true for a lymphoma line called Jekyll-1 targeted with CD19 CAR, where there again was no significance um, between wild type and gamma receptor 1 knockout killing. And then this was also true in multiple myeloma. Here I'm showing a, a cell line called RPMI A226 targeted with BCMA cars. We brought this in vivo, first with the leukemic line with NOM6 targeted with C19 car, again, luciferized that we can image over time. And so what we observed is that wild type um, tumor responded to CD19 CAR, interfering gamma receptor one knockout tumor responded to CD19 CAR, and only when we knocked out the antigen CD19 did the tumor no longer respond to CD19 CAR. This was also true for multiple myeloma. This is a, a different line called MM1S. It engrafts um, in the bone marrow when you inject IV, so it, it really recapitulates what we see clinically with, with multiple myeloma. And again, what we observe here is that while wild type and interferon gamma receptor one knockout tumors respond to BCMA cars, BCMA knockout tumors do not. So this was very interesting to us because this is showing that across solid and liquid tumors, we're seeing a very different response on the tumor side, depending on if interferon gamma receptor signaling was present or not. So we wanted to bring this to a more um, basic science understanding and try to figure out what, what could be different and how these tumor cells are responding to CAR T cells. So we did what every scientist does at this point and does, did some sequencing. Um, and so we had just a very simple co-culture experiment where we did a low E to T ratio of um, effector CAR T cells to tumor cells um, so that we could keep some of the tumor cells alive and whatever was alive, we would go on to sequence. And we have this nice red green system. So we were actually able to sequence both the T cells and the tumor cells after this culture and, and look at them transcriptionally. So first looking at the T cell side, and these are the EGFR cars that had been exposed to various types of U87 glioblastoma cells, either wild type interferon gamma receptor one knockouts or EGFR knockouts. And so what we saw here was really interesting because the, the EGFR car looked the same if it saw a wild type or interferon gamma receptor one knockout 
But if it had no activation through EGFR with the EGFR or antigen knockout tumor, we had a very different signature. But across donors, you actually couldn't tell the difference if the T cell had seen a wild type or interferon gamma receptor one knockout. And so this validated what we had seen phenotypically with our um, with a lack of difference in any kind of activation or proliferation or phenotype over time. Um, but this validated at the transcriptional scale as well. However, if we looked at the tumor side of that same experiment, we see something very different. This time, the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts clustered more closely to the EGFR knockouts or antigen knockouts compared to wild type. And you can see on this heat map, there's a, a very distinct difference between these very cold tumors of the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts compared to wild type. We also ran this experiment on the liquid side using our NOM6 C19 model. And the NOM6 looked very different. This time, the wild type and interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts looked much more similar compared to the antigen knockout. So we're getting very different pathways activated across these different tumor types in response to, to CAR. And this is dependent on the interferon gamma receptor 1 signaling pathway for the solid, but this appears to be dispensable in the NOM6 story. So we looked a little closer at these different signatures to see if anything kind of popped out to us. And what caught our eye was the immune cell adhesion and migration score. And I'm going to lean more towards the cell adhesion because this is all occurring again in a dish. Um, so migration is less of an issue because this is a confluent dish where the T cells are being plopped on top. This is not happening in vivo where we really require some migration. Um, and so the cell adhesion really caught our eye because this is something that was very highly upregulated in the wild type U87 GBM cells and very downregulated in the gamma receptor 1 knockouts and the antigen knockout. On the NOM6, again, this was the opposite story. The interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts had high cell adhesion scores compared to wild type. Um, while the antigen knockouts did not. So we had a new system in the lab where we're able to test cell binding avidity through acoustic force and microscopy. So just to, to break down how this experiment works a little bit, we have these microfluidic chambers that we're able to coat with solid tumor cells. Um, you can also coat liquid tumor cells as well, but this, this we did with the U87 cells. So they attach to the bottom, and then you're able to flow over either untransduced T cells or CAR T cells on top, allow them to incubate for a period of time, and then acoustic force is applied with a ramp up over time, and a microscope is able to track if the T cells um, remain bound to the tumor cells or if they begin to lift off in response to the acoustic force. And then you can generate curves where you see the amount of remaining bound T cells as that acoustic force is applied. And so when we did this on our various tumor knockouts, we were shocked to see that there was a very distinct difference between the wild type and interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts. And so again, here what we're seeing um, is that the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts almost look as though they have no antigen present. The T cells are have such a deficit in their ability to bind these tumor cells compared to wild type. And so if we look at 500 piconewtons of force, we can see there's a very significant difference in a CAR T cell's ability to bind a wild type cell compared to if the interferon gamma receptor one molecule is present or not. And so we wanted to validate this in another way. Um, and so I can show you these movies here. Again, the T cells are the small bits and then the, the larger cells are um, the tumor cells. And so we used um, the, the actual view fields from the microscope is shown on the left and on the right is a masking program. And so what we were able to do is over a period of 25 minutes, and so there's a frame taken every two and a half minutes, we were able to track how long a T cell spent with a given tumor cell using this masking program. And so what we get out is something that looks like um, this image on the right, where the colder color or more blue um, a various track is, that means the less time the T cell spent with that tumor cell, whereas the more red, the, the 
track is that means the longer that T cell incubated with that tumor cell. And so we ran this for our various knockouts, our wild type, um, interferon gamma receptor one knockout or EGFR knockout. And what we observed is that there was a significant difference in the amount of time that T cells were spending bound to a wild type cell compared to an interferon gamma receptor one knockout. And so there was a, a significant difference showing that the T cells were no longer able to bind or interact with the, the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts as long. So we went back to our transcriptional data to see what genes could be playing a role in this, it seems like lack of adhesion. Um, that we were observing and something that popped out in one of our top 25 hits as to differential response between the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts and the wild type is an adhesion molecule called ICAM-1. So this has actually been studied since the 90s and is known to be downstream of interferon gamma receptor signaling, um, but only recently has started coming back into the literature as something of interest. And so we went just to our wild type cells and we either um, left them alone or exposed them to EGFR car. And we were shocked to see that after exposure to EGFR car, we had upwards of 100 fold upregulation of um, ICAM-1 on the surface of these tumor cells. And so I should say that these wild type cells are um, with, without any car exposure are 100% positive for ICAM-1. What happens is a massive upregulation of the amount of ICAM-1 on the surface, which is why we're looking at MFI here. However, if cells are not able to respond to interferon gamma, such as the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts, we see that there's only about a twofold or threefold increase in the amount of ICAM-1 on the surface of those tumor cells. And in fact, the EGFR knockouts had even higher upregulation of ICAM-1 compared to our interferon gamma receptor knockouts. And my theory behind this is the cars that they're being exposed to, even though they're not being activated, are secreting some amount of interferon gamma, um, even without activation. And these cells can still respond to interferon gamma. So they actually have higher levels of ICAM-1 compared to the interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts. So we looked and um, decided to do more of our cytotoxicity assays, this time just playing around with the ICAM-1 pathway. So we just use commercially available ICAM-1 blocking antibody on wild type um, U87 GBM cells. And we were able to see that when CAR T cells um, were incubated with the ICAM-1 blockaded tumor cells, if the ICAM-1 was blocked, the CAR T cells were not able to kill as well, suggesting that this adhesion pathway is intrinsic to CAR T cells' actual ability to bind and successfully exert killing of these tumor cells. And then there's binding partners on the T cell side of the ICAM-1 adhesion access axes, which is LFA-1. And so there are two molecules that make up the LFA-1 molecule called CD11A and CD18. And if you block either of these, CAR T cells again have um, less killing of wild type tumor cells, again, suggesting that this pathway is needed for a true synapse to form and for the tumor cells to die. Um, so then we wanted to know, can we overcome all of these issues that we've seen with a lack of interferon gamma receptor signaling just by playing around with this ICAM-1 side of things. So we overexpressed ICAM-1 on our interferon gamma receptor 1 knockouts up to those hundred fold levels of increased expression that we saw post EGFR car. And what we were able to do was successfully restore cell binding avidity to wild type levels of the interferon gamma receptor one knockouts. I will say every T cell got stickier just by um, increasing ICAM-1 levels. However, there's still a difference if antigen is present or not, even when ICAM-1 is overexpressed. And then if we look at cytotoxicity of these same interferon gamma receptor one knockouts that now overexpress ICAM-1, we're able to restore CAR T cells ability to kill again to wild type levels just by overexpressing this adhesion molecule. So in conclusion, what we've talked about today is that there's a difference in how solid tumors and liquid tumors are responding to CAR T cell killing. So we showed here that loss of interferon gamma receptor one signaling is it necessary in glioblastoma and other solid tumors for CAR T cells to successfully exert killing, but this does not seem to be important in the liquid tumor role of CAR T cell cytotoxicity. 
And we think that in solid tumors, the reason why this is happening is due to downstream upregulation of ICAM-1, um, downstream of interfering gamma. And so this is produced by the CAR T cells. The ICAM-1 gets upregulated, and the CAR T cells are better able to bind and then kill the tumor cells when this is present. So you can overcome interfering gamma receptor um, deficient cells, uh, tumor cell killing just by overexpressing ICAM-1. And just to put this in context of the fields and, and why I, I and the lab thinks this is so important is that so much of what we have learned in the CAR T cell field is from C19 CAR. It has been wildly successful with profound clinical responses. And so it makes sense that we're taking a lot of what we've learned based on CD19. However, I think that we need to be a little bit more broad in how we apply these principles as we try to expand into solid tumors. And I think there are many reasons why solid tumors have been more difficult for CAR T cells, but part of it is probably that our basic science understanding is not necessarily well-founded by learning everything from CD19. And so I think that for every CAR context, car context that we're trying to treat in every indication, we need to think about how the tumor is responding to the car, because while the car may appear the same, the tumor cells are definitely responding differently. And so we think that cell avidity is also being shown to have a more significant role in target cell response to car, and perhaps by increasing CAR T cell adhesion, you could overcome some of the, the deficits on, in killing on the tumor cell side. And with that, I'd like to thank um, my lab. I've had a very supportive um, mentor, Marcella Moss, who's a fantastic physician scientist. Um, she brings uh, the cars that we make in the lab to the clinic, and we've successfully opened clinical trials based on this. And then also um, Mike Can, he is a technician in the lab who put in um, tremendous amounts of works to this study specifically, as well as our collaborators at the Broad Institute from both the Regev lab and the, the Getz lab, and the Micron core over at HMS who helped with all of those beautiful microscope images, specifically the um, the timing of the, the T cell synapse. And then we also um, have a lot of thanks to our funding and Lumix who helped with cell binding avidity assays. Um, and this was all part of my thesis work. So my, my committee and the Harvard graduate program in immunology as well. Thank you.